On behalf of the family, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today to pay tribute to our mother and grandmother and aunt and friend, uh, to Mindela Lam, Mindel Bat Reb Shalom, Allah Shalom. This has been a very, very difficult time for us, for the family and for people everywhere in dealing with this terrible illness and uh, not being able to pay proper respects to those who have passed away. This uh, Zoom tribute is a brief opportunity for us to try to give our mother and grandmother uh, the, the, the respect and the kavod that she deserves. I'd like to start reading a chapter of Tehillim. Nechtam David shamreni el ki chasiti vach, amart ladunai adunai ata tovati bal alecha. Liktoshim asher ba'aretz hima v'yadirei kochef sivam, kirbu atzvotam acher maharu, Adonai <laughs> Kilota azov nav shilish all, otitain chasid chaler od shachat, to the any orech chayim, so vas machot et panecha, ni emote bimin chanetzach. We will have tributes to Mandela Lamb from her family, from her four children, Chaya Warburg, Joshua Lamb, Shalom Lamb, by myself, Mark Dratch, her son in law, by grandchildren to Mark Gross, Yoni Lamb, Devorah Lamb, Sam Dratch. And finally, by Rabbi Dr. J.J. Schechter. Hi, I'm Chaya Lam Warburg. I'm, I'm Mindy Lam's and Dr. Lam's oldest daughter. And I have great hesitation to speak at this event because I feel that nothing so small will do my mother justice it's very hard to capture her in under five minutes. So I'll just, I'll just say a couple of things um, and I'm sure other people will, will touch on other aspects of her. Um, my mother, as literally every person has said to me today, is a true lady and a class act. She was elegant and she was of course lovely. There is so much to say about my mother because she had so many facets to her life. But her life was not painted in broad strokes. Wife, mother, grandmother, daughter, community leader. But what she did was she excelled in attention to detail. And it's the details of each and every one of your lives, her attention to those details, that is what endeared her to everyone. From the elevator man, to the cleaning women, to the delivery boys who remember her great tips. Um, to our classmates, to our children, to our grandchildren, to world famous dignitaries and halachic luminaries. She treated everybody the same. So I'm torn between telling of stories and capturing her essential qualities, but I'll go with three lessons that immediately came to mind when I thought about what to say. And the first is the one that I just noted, which is, Loosely translated, um, you should accept each person um, with, with grace um, or with a good attitude. Um, as above, my mother greeted everyone as if they were the most important person in the room. She gave them her full attention, her eye contact, her smile, her dimples. She truly, truly cared about each person and remembered and encountered every detail of their lives to them when she spoke to them again, because she was truly interested and truly cared. Additionally, going to the other meaning of that, of that aphorism, she was remarkably, especially for her generation, non-judgmental. She never said a word of Lashon Hara. It, it could be because Boba raised her with the, uh, with the um, uh, Rashi tables of LHMFG, Lashon Hara means fire in Gehenna, but, but it went way beyond that. She accepted everybody for who they are. 
She didn't impose her standards on them, which really allowed people to relax in her presence and to be their authentic true selves. This was really at both of my parents' core of the way they dealt with people in the world. And this is what enabled her to be, I think, to navigate people of every stripe um, and to really influence people by her mere acceptance um, of, of who they are and as their authentic true selves. Um, she, she was a matriarch um, in, a matriarchal, in a matriarchal family and she was really, um, her, her non-judgmental acceptance of people is really a lesson for, for all of us. And I think it's a lesson that we all incorporated um, as her family. The, the other two qualities that I want to discuss um, were the, the other two that uh, were really My mother was our link of the generations. She, um, one of the reasons why this is such a cruel ending for her is that she is the person in the family, both her family and my father's, who really took care of all of the antiques and all of the elderly in our family. And she's the one who made sure that they lived full lives to the very end. She took care most recently of my Aunt Bracha. She took care of Aunt Minnie and Aunt Pauli and Bubba. She took care of my Baba and my Zaida. And she didn't just take care of them as if it were a chore. She gave them her full devotion and the, her full attention with, with joy. And that is something we can only hope to emulate, which I hope, wished we were able to do for her in the same way. And unfortunately, as circumstances didn't permit it, but it is such a horrible irony. Um, she was also our link to the next generation. She, her greatest joy, I think, was in her role as a mother. Um, you know, I don't know if she would have signed her name in current parlance as S-A-H-M, but she did her stay-at-home mothering, not as a job, but as really her true calling. She did everything um, completely and fully. Her greatest joy in her family were the babies. Those babies, she lived for the babies. She lived for her children, for her grandchildren, for her nieces and nephews. I think all of my first cousins and my second cousins feel as embraced by my mother as her own children do. And she truly cared for all of you. I mean, you felt it because she meant it. Um, and everybody, Susie, wanted to be her favorite, my father's favorite granddaughter and my, my mother's favorite niece and my father's favorite niece because she made, they made everybody feel that way. Um, but their Kibudava aim, both of my parents, was really legendary. Um, and and it, it's just very sad that we weren't able to do things in the same way. We have the same passion for them, but unfortunately we couldn't execute on it the way, the way we would have liked to. And the third, the third, um, and, and also she kept us connected. Um, for, since I was a little child, we had family circles at our house. And what was the family circle about in the Mailer family? Everybody was fighting about who was gonna get buried next to mama. Their mother was like a tzaddikis and a saint and their family circles were all about who would have the zechus of being married next to this matriarch of the family who I, I am named for. Um, and they were together like a group my entire life. My Uncle Charlie, my Uncle Davey, my Boba, my Aunt Minnie and Aunt Polly. They were, they, these people were all a team. They were an old American team. They're, they live together, they're buried together. We grew up on stories of, of our, all of our circle of rust and dust and all, all of the, the people who came before us. And so my parents really made this link, my mother especially, to, for us so that we really feel enriched by the lives of the people who came before us. They were very much part of our day-to-day -day existence, their sayings, their aphorisms, um, their names. Um, and that was her kabeira to the It was really to the nth degree. And the third quality that really made our childhood an absolute joy and which I think inculcated Judaism within us, which maybe today might be called informal, informal Jewish education, but then I would, I would call that quality Ibdu Hashem B'Simcha. 
My mother made every Jewish event joyous. Purim was, you know, dozens and dozens of mishloch manot spread across the table. Um, and we went at it with zeal. Everybody remembers how she prepared for Pesach, if, if you remember that far back, um, with her chopper thing and sitting in the kitchen with the bubble with her applesauce thing and her pineapple thing. Um, every holiday was celebrated to the nth degree. Um, and I think that's what gives us this passion for celebrating every single holiday together as a large family because that's the way we were raised. That's the way we were raised by my mother. That's the way we were raised by my grandparents. Um, so every Jewish event is an event to be, to be celebrated. Um, and I'll close with that. I think I've gone over my time. Thank you so much for your patience. Mommy, I ask your forgiveness for everything that I left out of this. We will miss you terribly. Hi, my name is Josh Lamb, and I'm my mother's second child. I'll begin my remarks by stating the obvious. The only person on earth who could possibly do justice to memorializing my mother is my father. Rabbi Dr. Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb would have been the speaker you should have been hearing today. He's unable to be here today due to poor health, and we pray for his refuah. Our family developed a tradition over many years of spending Pesach Sedarim together. Like many families, when it came time to sing Chad Gadya, we distributed parts to everyone sitting around the table. We had props and we had costumes for the dog, the ox, the stick, the fire, etc. Parts were generally assigned around the table at random. <clears throat> but there were three exceptions. My son Yoni was always the Chad Gadya, the goat. My father, of course, was always typecast in the role of God. For some counterintuitive reason that I cannot recall, it became tradition for my mother, who had a wonderful sense of humor, to be cast as the Malachamavis, the angel of death. So we closed our Seder each year happy, full, exhausted, feeling cozy and close as a family, with the loud, spirited, and very funny Chad Gadya as our closing act. My mother took pleasure, immense pleasure, in her duties as the angel of death and made a huge show of mocking the Malach HaMavis and of slaughtering the ox. Alas, this Pesach, the Malach HaMavis took his revenge. Mom was taken from us way too soon, way too fast, and in the horribly sadistic fashion that COVID-19 is notorious for. As Chaya mentioned, my mother was incapable of seeing suffering and not acting. She was a passionate advocate and a champion of those who were in pain and in need of friendship and help. Mommy would never look away and would never walk away when there was a need. She was drawn to and not repelled by poverty, illness, or disease in others. She recognized that it was her obligation to be there for those less fortunate than herself. And she sacrificed, truly sacrificed for others. She was the ultimate sacrificial lamb. The four of us children watched this play out before our very eyes for our entire lives. When we were young, my mother took in her own mother after Bubba was felled by a devastating stroke. She lived in our home with mom by her side for four years until she died. Then for many years, my mother watched over, fretted over and nursed the two aunts, Aunt Minnie and Aunt Polly. When my father's parents became ill and infirm and needed to be placed in the Riverdale Hebrew home, my mother visited them on most days of the week. These visits were not perfunctory and they were not superficial flyby visits. They lasted for hours. She gave my grandparents, her in-laws, her time, her companionship. She helped them to walk, to eat. She cheered them up and intervened with the staff on their behalf. When my parents had the ability to go to Israel for a six month period, mom took a volunteer job at the hospital there and spent most of her time holding babies and singing and reading to small children. Years later, when my Aunt Bracha became ill, mom was by her side every day, taking her to doctors, appointments, to the bank, spending hours, days, and weeks with her. Eventually, my mother, in a not rare act of true self-sacrifice, brought her sister into my parents' home, where mom doted on her, served her, supported her. And when my aunt and 
And that's where my aunt lived until shor shor shortly before her death about a year ago. For the past few years, as my father's health began to decline, my mother was by his side constantly in terrible physical pain herself. Mommy never grew weary of taking care of him. My mother was my father's best friend, biggest supporter and fiercest critic. She was his sounding board and his confidant. My mom forever with her feet firmly planted on the ground helped guide and encourage him. My father would be the very first to admit that half of the accolades, honor and esteem that was given to him throughout his life began rightly to his wife, my mother. In the past few years that have been most difficult for my father, you could watch their love for each other grow even stronger and deeper. My parents never ones to be physically demonstrative with each other in front of the children could be seen at the table holding hands with my mom's head gently resting on my father's shoulder. During the more than half a century of helping everyone, I never once heard a word of complaint from my mother. The help she offered others was full-hearted, sincere. It was never just superficial, and she never ever expected or wanted anything in return. It's what you do for family is what she would say whenever we kids would suggest that she take, easy, take it easy and slow down. Her selflessness and generosity was not only directed to the old and infirm, but to her nieces and nephews, to her friends, to her friends' children, and to total strangers as well and especially with her work through Yeshiva University and the YU Women's Organization. There was no one on earth more privileged than myself and my siblings. We grew up in a home that was warm, loving, encouraging, accepting, challenging, filled with ideas, creativity, and with song. My father brought Torah, scholarship, a love of learning, and a love of Judaism into our home. My mother took us to museums, Carnegie Hall, to the Philharmonic, to the Metropolitan and New York State Opera, to the ballet, to Broadway and off-Broadway shows. Together, my parents created a home environment that was deep and meaningful, fun and exciting, one that was filled with amazing experiences and guests. When I think of growing up on West 86th Street, I mostly think of singing. My mother had the most beautiful, beautiful voice. On Friday night, after we exchanged Divrei Torah, talked about what we were learning in school and ate a delicious meal, we would sing for hours and hours. You had to see my mother during those times. She was joyous, she was happy, content, radiant, and proud. She was a very wise mother. When I was about six or seven years old, I had a crisis of confidence. One day I came to her crying my eyes out. She sat me down and asked me what was wrong. I told her that I don't know if I'll ever be able to get a job and make a living when I grow up. She listened patiently, probed a bit deeper, and in between tears, I confess that I was afraid that the only thing I might be able to do with my life is to be a garbage man. She hugged me, put me on her lap and wiped away my tears. When I finally calmed down, she told me that it was fine for me to be a garbage man as long as I was the best garbage man I could possibly be. Everyone wanted to be in my mother's orbit. She had a very big heart and a very big tent. She had many friends and people felt privileged to know her. As I was thinking about what to say today, I reflected that my mother really had a great life. And she did, or did she? She lost her father when she was 12 years old and she lost my dear sister, Sarah, seven years ago. The loss of a child is a devastating blow and one that never quite goes away. She had every right to be depressed, to turn sullen, bitter and isolated. But my mother had a great life because she demanded it of herself. She rose above her grief and never imposed it on anyone else. Six months, after, six months after Sarah's death, my parents attended the marriage of my son Yehuda and his wonderful wife, Angela. My father and mother's unrestrained joy in Simcha was superhuman, but it was not an act. They remained positive, engaged, devoted to family without the slightest hint of bitterness. Mom was very inquisitive and never tired of asking about what her grandchildren were doing with their lives. Each and every grandchild knew to a certainty that she was grandma's favorite. She was delighted that my oldest son Yoni discovered real artistic talent. She was his biggest booster and also his first customer with his work proudly displayed in the dining room. She was always worried about my son Daniel's career in the NYPD and the Marine Corps. She was always concerned about his safety but never stopped feeling very proud and very safe when he was around. Grandma was fascinated by what my younger son Yehuda did for a living. When he told her that he was working as a computer engineer for Uber, which she forever pronounced as Uber, 
Um, she thought that he was driving cars for a living. He would patiently explain to her what he did and she beamed with pride but understood not one word of the explanation. Mom loved Angela like her own granddaughter. She was fascinated by her amazing projects and her passion and her beauty. Each one was grandma's favorite. Mom also loved and admired Rifki as she did all her in-law children. Rifki once remarked oh, what a great mother-in-law mom was to her and to the others. Rifki, mom loved your sensitivity, your scholarship, your teaching, and how well you take care of me and the boys. I mentioned at the very beginning of my remarks that the only one who could possibly do justice to memorializing my mother is my father. And that unfortunately, he's un and that, and that unfortunately he's unable to address us today to share his feelings and his insights with us. But that's actually not quite true. On a very terrible day seven years ago, the entire family gathered to be with my sister Sarah in her final hours. I was there to bid fair, farewell to a very precious human being whom I love deeply and dearly. And my parents were there to say goodbye to their youngest child. The family spoke gently, sang and reminisced and told Sarah how much we loved her. At times like this, it would have been natural that my father as head of the family would speak to us all and help us understand the, meanings of, the meaning of Sarah's life and death. He would have with his brilliant insight and his poetic language helped both Sarah and all of us navigate the transition between life and death. But alas, by that time, my father was having trouble with speech and language and sitting next to him, I could sense his frustration. And then my mother began to speak. She told, she told us about Sarah, about who Sarah was, what she was like as a daughter, of my parents' boundless love for her. She taught us how to grieve this loss and how to remain positive and strong and grateful to Hashem for his many blessings. We had never heard my mom so effortlessly step into my father's shoes to comfort and inspire us the way she did on that terrible day. When my mother was finished speaking, my father removed a piece of paper from his pocket and wrote something on it and slipped it to me. He wrote out just four words. It said, and this is my father's hespaid for his wife. It simply said, your mother is magnificent. Mom, you are magnificent. You are elegant, you are wise. You are deeply loved and deeply missed. I'm uh, Shalom Lam, uh, my parents' third child. There's a surreal, impersonal cruelty in delivering a few short minutes of remarks about my remarkable mother in this impersonal setting, speaking to a computer screen. But then it seems fitting as these final weeks have been nothing but cruel and so unsettling and tearing us from our natural inclinations of being at my mother's side, of holding her hand, of telling her in person how much we love and cherish her. The iron is even more acute knowing that anytime anyone in the family was hospitalized, mom always insisted on getting them a personal nurse for the first few days at her expense, because she said no one should ever be alone in a hospital. To mom being alone at a time of crisis was unthinkable, but that's what happened to her. From time to time since my father became ill, I would quietly put things in a private folder I would keep in case I needed to recall memories. But I never kept such a list of memories for mom because she was so strong. There would be years of time for that. Who could ever have imagined I would need to recall these memories now? I'm named for my, father's, for my mother's father, Shalom. My mom's father died when she was 12 years old. And every single time I asked my mother about her father, I think without exception, she got teary. The pain of that loss never fully healed, even with the passage of well over half a century. And here I am 60 years old and I've lost my mother. But what an incredible bracha that I had my mom in good health for all of these years. It's important to say and recognize that our family has been blessed over and over and over again. My mother had more than her shares of hardship and tragedy, particularly with the loss of my dear sister, Sarah, seven years ago, my father's long illness and my mother being the last survivor of her siblings. And yet she always described her life as the great adventure. Mom's life has been incredible. She married a brilliant young scholar and they were so different. It's almost comical. 
indeed only because her mother insisted that she even agree to go out with him. She was beautiful, a fabulous athlete, a natural swimmer, popular, a third generation American. Young Norman Lamb was none of those things. He was brilliant, mature beyond his years. He audited French for crying out loud. He wrote Hebrew poetry and as he described it, was always chosen last for any game of sports. As for swimming, he naturally sank. And these two seemingly different people forged a bond that can only be properly, dis properly described as a love story. They fiercely loved each other. I never once heard a real argument between them. Disagreements are often very funny as dad's extraordinarily lo extraordinary love usually was accompanied by his brilliant and often hilarious and sharp sense of humor. Over time, mom became dad's critical sounding board and his fiercest private critic. But in public, she always set the standard for Kavad Harav. She always referred to him in public as Rabbi Lamb or Dr. Lamb. And this was even true at many family events. She modeled elegance, decorum, propriety. She was the most elegant person I've ever, ever met. Whenever my siblings and I, or the next generation, had to decide on what the proper thing to do was in any given situation, we would joke, so what would Mindy do? That was the catchphrase. Mom was our gold standard of proper behavior, of kindness, of generosity, of rightness, of going that extra mile for all people. Mom and dad were Jewish royalty. Indeed, as news as mo of mom's death reached a very dear family friend, he texted to me, Baruch Dayan HaEmes, the world has lost a royal queen to all of us. Her kindness extended to the rich and powerful, but was more keenly felt and applied with the same rigor and expansive heart for everyone, no matter their station in life. Just recently, mom had our childhood housekeeper, a much loved and today senior citizen who worked for my parents in the early 1960s up to her apartment for a week from North Carolina, complete with Broadway shows and meals out with my mother. Reese Locklear was treated like royalty because to my mother, all good people deserve to be treated like royalty. For many people as they age, their circle of interests shrink until they're only concerned with their own personal needs. Not so mom. She delighted in others' triumphs. She knew so, so many people's family interests because she truly cared. The circle of people about whom she encountered concern, was concerned was enormous and ever expanding. She was a mathematical anomaly in that she could increase and multiply her care for others, but not diminish her individual attention to us. She could multiply, but not divide. There were many highlights to her adventurous life, a life of aesthetic beauty and passionate love of classical music, a life surrounded by and in the service of scholars, and a life of travel and of charity. I think mom rose to her most of majestic height of personal strength, exactly as Josh described at the tragic death of my sister, Sarah. She was superhuman in her eloquence to us at that pivotal moment. She led the family at that moment in a way that is seared into my memory. And in the end, she promised Sarah she would never forget her. And we make that promise to you, mom. We will never forget you, not for a day. I'm not sad for mom. She loved life. Although she lost a great many wonderful people who are larger than life figures, the most special, of course, was Sarah, but her mother and Minnie and Polly, her brother and her sisters, her father, who she always mourned. She is welcomed now by them. What a reunion that must be. I'm so happy, genuinely happy for Sarah to have her beloved mother back. What a privilege it was to grow up in her household. Mom, we will always love, admire, and cherish you. And I believe with all my heart, we will all be re reunited one day. And what a great reunion that will be. My name is Mark Dredge, and I'm the fourth child. But I think that my sisters-in-law can say the same thing. Because for mom and for dad, there was no difference. We were warmly embraced. Each of us came into a family which uh, overwhelmed us and intimidated us. And many of us couldn't find a voice around the Shabbos table for a year or two years or even more. But there was an acceptance and a love and a support uh, that helped to make us who we are and make us part of family, not in-laws, but children. As Josh said, the only one who could give the proper eulogy and the proper tribute to mom is her husband. Um, 
but I'd like to share a few words with you that he wrote in a very different context that I think speak to the moment. He quoted the famous Medrash that at Kriyat Yamsuf, as the Egyptian army was being drowned in the sea, the angels started to sing, and God silenced them, and he, and he exhorted them, my creation is drowning in the sea. How can you sing song? How can you sing my praise? And then Rabbi Lamb went on to ask, but that's the case, how were the Jewish people able to sing Az Yashir? And how do we, their descendants, every year on Pesach, sing Hallel, even a half Hallel, during the later days of Pesach, Maaseya Dai Tovim Bayam, Yatem Omrim Shira. And Dad wrote, I would suggest an answer that there are two kinds of Shira. One is the song of exultation, the cry of triumph and victory and conquest, when God has manifested his omnipotence by the destruction of his enemies. It is this kind of shira that the angels endeavored to sing. This sort of song is quite natural and would be acceptable, but not at a time when Maaseya died tovim bayam, when God's human creatures experience the sufferings and pangs of death. The other song is not that of triumphant exultation, but the expression of gratitude for existence itself. Quoting the Ma'aral, Dad went on to define this type of shira as the longing of the effect for the cause, like a teacher, a student for a teacher, or a child for a parent. This shira, therefore, is that of yearning rather than rejoicing, nostalgia rather than jubilation. It is the effect pining for the cause and not the elation of conquest. It's a song in which we acknowledge a person as the source of the meaningfulness of our lives, the effect of which that person is the cause. And that too is Shira. It is the acknowledgement of nostalgia, that recognition of indebtedness for existence and the quality of our existence, and therefore constitutes a true Shira, the, the nature of a song of longing. And this is the song, this is the shira that we sing now for mom. As Maaseya Dai Tovim Bayam, as we face our own loss, and singing is so difficult. But it's a song of tribute to a wife, a daughter, a daughter in law, a sister, a mother, a grandmother, to the first lady of the Jewish community. Mom was the Rachel to her husband's Rabbi Akiva. Shalom, shalom. Inshallah, Shalanu. This regal, elegant woman, always with a fashionable scarf, perfectly coiffed, formal and proper, and yet loving and warm, cared about people, remembered everyone that she met, and could ask for them by name. And Shira's song, music, was an important part of her life, as you've already heard from my siblings in law. In her youth, she was a member of a choir. Shabbos Miros around her table were delightful. Everyone sang, so the entire family with beautiful voices sang and harmonized so beautifully. And they would all turn to me, Mark Dratch, you just sit and be quiet. You just listen, that was my job. She loved her favorite songs, Lamana Chai Verayai, Sim Shalom, and so many others. And she loved opera. And I was the beneficiary of that. When I came into the family, I got a lesson what it meant to love opera. She and Aunt Bracha had a yearly subscription to the Metropolitan Opera, and when they couldn't go, I was always I was always the fill-in, and at other times, at other times as well. And often, when there was an opera that was airing on Channel 13, she would call me, or if I got lucky, I would call her first to a heads up. There's something that you might want to listen to. We learned from Mom the meaning of culture. In the table that she sat with no bottles and no cans, a beautiful crystal, to the home that she kept, to the opera, the ballet, the ballet, the theater, and for her grandchildren, the circus, grandma days, clothes, shoes, and haircuts. Mom was genuous, genuinely pious. To watch her light Shabbos candles or to watch her daven was, it was a lesson in Yerat Shemayim. 
She had great respect for Torah teachers. Although a student in public school and in Hunter College, she was sent by her mother to Beis Yaakov as a student of Robertson Bender and Robertson Kaplan. As you heard, and I won't elaborate, she lived for others, whether it was her mother or her aunts or her mother-in-law or her father-in-law or her sister or us when Sarah was sick and Sarah passed away. She lived a life of chesed, especially, especially devoted to the YU Women's Organization, arranging every year for their lecture series and worrying about who she would invite and how it would be accepted and what the topics should be, especially support for students, for students who, despite uh, whatever scholarships they may have had, didn't have enough money for clothes or enough money for food, and she insisted and she made sure that they were taken care of properly. She was our rock. And despite, especially in the later years, her own personal pain and physical limitations, she never said no. That word was not part of her vocabulary. Like all the other women in this matriarchy of the extended male or family, she was resilient, determined, and strong-willed. Mom and I had a special relationship. She and Sarah Allah Shalom were bonded uh, in ways the phone would ring early in the morning and it was mom and Sarah talking on the phone in the same way a dozen, two dozen, three, three dozen times every day. To her, I had one name, two syllables attached with no hyphen and no space, it's Mark Dratch. Mark Dratch, this is Mrs. Lamb, she would say, and our conversation would begin. She was like a mother to me, always supportive, inquisitive, and caring. True when Sarah was alive, and even more so afterwards. And despite that unbear unbearable loss, as you've heard, she carried herself with dignity. She was present in a rock for each of us, for me, for my children, for Tova, and for Yali, and for Sam, and for Bobby. I had the great privilege of being able to learn with my father-in-law, with Dr. Lamb, the Chavrusa, um, once, sometimes twice a week, and very often in his, in his office, the office of the president of Yeshiva University. But uh, I always suspected that our ability to learn together and the time we had together was just an excuse. Because you see, every time we learned together, she would send meat from, and chickens from the butcher or clothes from the store or shoes that I had, that my father-in-law had to bring in his chauffeur-driven car, carried by himself in the elevator up to his office on the fifth floor in first hall for me after we learned to take into my car to deliver to Sarah. I think the two of us were just conduits between the two of them. tovim bayam, v'yatem omrim shira. Mom, hospitalized in such a tragic way during Pesach, v'yatem omrim shira, but we do, because she taught us how to sing and we sing today the song of longing the shira of gratitude for love and for culture, shira to someone who gave meaning to our lives. We pray that the song of her life will continue to echo, to echo in our hearts and our memories and those of our children and our grandchildren for generations to come. Hi, my name is Tamar Warburg Gross and I'm one of the grandchildren. I'm Chaya's second daughter. Growing up as a child of public figures surely presents challenges sometimes, but as a grandchild, there is only upside. When we were growing up, 101 Central Park West was for us Lamb grandchildren what 770 Eastern Parkway is for Lubavitcher Hasidim. It was the central headquarters for our clan, the place we went to in order to be in the company of our beloved Rebbe and Rebetzin, Zaida and Grandma, and with our fellow Hasidim, my parents, aunts and uncles, sisters and cousins. There were Hanukkah parties, cigar smoke, a secret back staircase, a grand piano, a beautiful living room tapestry, chaise lounge chairs, which I never knew how to sit on properly or pronounce and still don't. There were Shabbos scrabble wars between Zaida and Aunt Brecha, grandma's mushroom rice, peach chicken and chicken fricassee and cries of, oh no, not the rag, when grandma, who we also knew as Mrs. Manners, came at our dirty faces with a warm shmata. 
And if 101 Central Park West was our second home, the Homoac and Sackett Lake were our third and fourth. And there too, grandma was front and center. When we arrived at the Homoac, whether for a Yom Tov or a long weekend, we would run up the stairs to the lobby, which we thought was so grand. Within a few moments, we would locate grandma who would generously dispense quarters from the many roles she had so that we could run down the stairs to play video games with our cousins. Pesach at the Homoac meant stopping at grandma and Zaida's room in the afternoon for chocolate lolly cones, egg kichel, and caramel clusters. It was Pesach from heaven, courtesy of Grandma Lamb and Barton's Candy Company. Sackett Lake may have been Zaida's dream home and grandma may not have cared for the country. She was a city mouse, but it too was grandma's domain. When we arrived, we would bound up the stairs to the porch to a wonderful greeting, grandma always with an apron. Zaida would host games of boggle on the porch as grandma supplied platters of grapes and baby carrots. A Sunday visit to the ice cream parlor on the main road and a trip to the Apollo Mall with grandma was just another level of amazing. During my first year of law school, I had the great privilege of living with grandma and Zaida. It was the privilege of living with greatness. Yes, I was living with a towering intellect, past president of a major university, a Torah scholar, Darshan par excellence, but I was also living with one of the most gracious, regal, elegant, generous, and cultured women in the entire world. A woman who had a commanding yet warm presence and who complimented my grandfather in a way that makes you believe quite firmly that God must be involved in Shidduchim. They were a match made in heaven and heaven gave them many good years. I learned how much Zaida and grandma teased each other, but lovingly, and how humor must be at the root of a successful marriage. I loved the call of Min, Nom. I learned that Zaida could not even help himself to a bowl of cereal on his own, but honestly, it was okay because grandma was always there to take care of everything he needed. Grandma absolutely delighted in her great-grandchildren. Watching her with a new great-grandchild was watching her transform before my eyes into a mother in her 20s or 30s. If I complained that my baby wouldn't finish a bottle, she would say, let me try. And trust me, the baby finished that entire bottle. She called my children every single Friday. She didn't stand on ceremony and wait for us. And she would sing the Shabbos to each one individually to the tune of happy birthday. My children anticipated these calls each Friday night with glee and loved singing in return. When I spoke to grandma, she would give me her full and undivided attention. Grandma had this wonderful habit of picking up our hand and holding it while she spoke to us. And this was just the warmest and most wonderful feeling of all. Grandma was like royalty and we were her very willing subjects. She doted on us, celebrating our successes as if they were her very own and also absorbing our challenges and our worries. She held up all of us and was a model of strength, resilience, fortitude, and faith. At my grandparents' 85th and 90th birthday party two and a half years ago, grandma shared some words with us. She said that 90% of her life was good. I remember thinking, like others have said, 90% good? Grandma lost her father when she was a young child and her daughter had died at the age of 50 after a devastating illness. 90% good? Yes. She meant it, and she said that it's how we weather the other 10% that proves what kind of metal we are made of. Grandma was made of steel. The greatest gift that Grandma and Zaida have given us is the gift of a very extraordinary family. Over decades, Grandma and Zaida lived and breathed Hanoch Lanar al Darko, of educating each grandchild individually, sensitively, according to his or her own specific needs. With their love and acceptance of all my sisters and cousins, no matter what, and of our spouses, they handcrafted a beautiful world for us and cultivated among us and within us an intense loyalty to family. This loyalty and these relationships are what will hold us in good stead now. Grandma, and it feels very strange to say this into the internet world, but Grandma, you don't have to worry about us anymore. You can rest your weary back and aching feet now and pass the baton to the next generations whom you educated so well. You have earned your place in Gan Eden a thousand times over. 
although we will never understand why God did not grant us the opportunity to hold your hand, we will weather this storm because you taught us how. We will take care of one another, we will hold our heads high and with dignity, and we will march on. Most importantly, when we are allowed to leave our homes, we will sit with Zaida and we will hold his hand just as you did. We will miss you terribly, we already do, but we will hear your singing voice and we will feel the squeeze of your wonderful hand. From the bottom of my very broken heart, thank you for the gift of being your granddaughter. It has been one of the greatest honors and privileges of my life and may your gracious and beautiful soul be bound up in the bonds of eternal life. Hi, um, my name is Yoni. I am uh, one of the many grandchildren of my grandma, Mindy Lamb. I know that there seems to be like a never ending amount of us and that's true, we do keep multiplying. <laughs> but that never stopped uh, my grandmother from making each one of us feel like the most important person in the world when we were spending time with her. One thing that I realized as I get older is that the truth is that many people, most people don't necessarily have a large family and even fewer have a, an actually emotionally close family, which only makes me appreciate all these times even more. Um, a lot of us, uh, every, every single grandchild had grandma days Basically, uh, a lot of us joke that one of my special trips that I'll get to take with grandma is to uh, go get my hair cut. This, uh, this all started when I was about a teenager. Uh, I'm considered to be one of the more artistically inclined in the family. And uh, as such, things like uh, specifically neat grooming don't necessarily take the highest priority with me at all times, but they did with my grandmother. So who decided that when I was about 16 or so and at the uh, height of my shagginess that I would start to accompany her to her hairdresser, Marilyn, and we would both spend a few hours getting a haircut, getting lunch, and just spending uh, a grandma day like, like we all were uh, lucky enough to do. Um, now, when this first started, uh, the place that we would meet was uh, at a place called Elizabeth Harden on Fifth Avenue. Now, for those of you who are familiar and those not, this is a sort of a quintessential New York iconic Fifth Avenue salon with all the pomp and circumstance associated with such a place, uh, trendy music, high class decor, uh, young, beautiful people swanning around asking if they can get you a nice coffee and all the other sorts of nice things that uh, you, know, you, you would imagine about such a place. My particular tastes don't exactly require such treatment, but this was all well good. It was exciting to be in such a place. And, and I was really just there to, to spend time with my grandmother and, uh, and uh, eventually ultimately get my hair cut. <laughs> um, this went on for a number of years. And then uh, one day I was speaking to my grandmother and she would say, as she often did, Yoni, I think it's time for a haircut. But when we discussed uh, where we were going to go meet, she mentioned a new address uh, in the same area, but a few blocks away, a little bit off the main drag. I thought nothing of it. I met her at the new place, still very nice, but a little bit smaller, not as ostentatious as the first place. And we met Marilyn and went about our business. Again, this went on for a few years. And again, at, at, at another point, when we spoke to arrange our next meeting, my grandmother said, listen, we're going to meet at another address. And uh, I never asked any questions. It didn't really matter to me. I said, fine, great. I'll meet you at this and this address. It was a, a few blocks further, even a little smaller and less trendy, but there was Marilyn and there we were to spend our time. 
and um and that was perfectly fine with me um and even though i didn't have to ask questions it was obvious that for whatever reason marilyn was the one who was moving around and that uh we were following her and uh at least for for 20 years for me since i was first invited to come on one of these trips and uh this really got me thinking about some of the more special traits that my grandmother displayed and passed along to all of us. Um, throughout their lives, my grandparents, due to their many accomplishments, interests, and pursuits, found themselves in situations and locales of great prestige, high class, luxury, and power. But that was never the primary reason that either of them were ever in a place like that. They were not there to be seen. They were not there to have their pictures taken, uh, to be part of some elite scene that can so often preoccupy and dazzle uh, many other people. They were always there for another reason. They were always there. The, the trappings of luxury were nice, but it was always secondary. They were there for a cause. They were there for a reason. They were there to be involved in making the Jewish community and the world a better place. Um, and uh, that was really what was important to them. Uh, my grandmother was fiercely loyal to all the people that she knew and held dear. She wasn't going to a fancy spot to be seen at a fancy spot. She was going to be going to this place to be loyal to Marilyn. And wherever Marilyn was going, that was where we were going. <laughs> because it was more important to be loyal and true to the people that mattered and spend time with the people that mattered than to be enraptured by some fleeting gilded frivolity. It was always about the people. Uh, my grandmother enjoyed um, meeting and spending time with people um, from all walks of life. And she was uniquely able to speak to pretty much anyone and meet them where they were. Uh, and, uh, you know, just um, treating them as, as, as they were the most important person in the world. And that the time that they were spending together right then and there was the most important thing that she could possibly be doing at any given time, uh, pay, paying them undivided attention and ultimately uh, being present um, and not uh, and 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 yeah, just be, being present, no matter no matter where she was or, or who she was with, and um, living her life that way um, has l left an absolutely indelible imprint on the way that I look at the world and how I choose to spend my time with people and experiences and try to push forward in this world and uh and grandma i mean every uh, to not and not to reiterate what everyone else already said but um just yeah we uh we learned so much from you we learned we enjoyed every moment with you and uh we're we're gonna carry we're gonna carry on all the messages and the important things that that the things that you held important um, in perpetuity because you were the one who taught us what was important in life uh, about people and about spending time and 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 that's what we're all gonna carry on from uh, from, from this experience. And we miss you and we love you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm Devorah Lamb. Um, I don't know how many of you know, but I'm actually the youngest grandchild of the Lamb family. Um, there are actually 17 of us and, and I'm the last one. Um, and, and everybody knows there are certain advantages of, of being the youngest. Um, you know, any notion that a strict bedtime uh, will be enforced is quickly dispelled once once the youngest comes along. Um, but there's another part of being the youngest that's that's a little bit distressing or even painful, I would venture to say. And and I think every youngest child and grandchild can relate to this. And it's the feeling that you've missed out on something. 
It's the feeling you get when there's a family history that happened before you were old enough to remember it or it happened before you were born. Um, the feeling when, when there's a story that everybody in family knows, um, but you only have vague memories of it. Just bits and pieces that you put together from pictures or fragments that you've fitted together from your siblings' recollections. The memories of my Zaida as a giant among scholars when he was uh, the, pre the rabbi of the Jewish Center, the president and chancellor of YU. Um, or memories of my mom's mother, Allah Shalom, who was so admired and so loved by every person who met her. Um, and then every memory I have of those people at those times are filled with such absolute love and admiration, but I was too young to appreciate them in the moment. And, and now that I'm older, the memories I have are so fleeting. So for the longest time, I've had the sense that my being the youngest meant that I missed out on the golden age of everyone in my family. But there was one major exception to that feeling. And this was a time when I, I really appreciated being the youngest, when the full-fledged gift of being the youngest, which I had stumbled upon purely by chance, hit me full in the face. And, and every feeling that I had that I was missing out on something just evaporated into thin air. And that was when I was with my grandma lamb, Allah Hashem, my wonderful and beloved grandma lamb. Um, you see, it's because my grandma and I were actually at the perfect stage of life for each other. And I know that sounds so silly because my grandma was 65 years older than I was, or just about. Um, but my grandma and I were at the perfect stage of life for each other. And I'll explain what I mean. Um, these past few years, I had the amazing privilege of actually staying at my grandma and Zayda's apartment in Manhattan for Shabbos for uh, about once a month. Um, and it was just my parents, my grandparents and myself for, for 25 hours. And I only got to do that because I'm the youngest. I'm only 23 years old. So until recently, I was a student with no classes on Friday. I'm not married, I don't have kids to take care of. So I had the luxury of being able to spend my Shabbat tot with my grandparents. Um, I didn't need to simultaneously play the role of spouse or mother. I didn't need to worry about my job or being an employee. Um, when I was at my grandparents' house for Shabbos, I could focus all my attention on just being my grandma's granddaughter. And by the same token, on the flip side, my grandma, when I was at her apartment, could focus all her attention on being my grandma. Um, when I was younger, as everyone here knows, um, my grandma dedicated herself to, to so many charities, to so many institutions, to so many people throughout the world, in addition to being the most wonderful wife and, and mother and grandmother. And then people, people make the mistake that my grandma's golden age was when she was on the world stage, um, when, when she was hand in hand with my Zaida, making changes globally and on a grand scale. But that's actually not correct. And that's not correct because my grandma was so special and unique that her golden age never ended. It didn't end, it just shifted. Um, for the past few years, as my grandma stepped out of the limelight, her new golden age materialized, and it was just as glorious and magnificent as her last one. Um, and this was her golden age of just being a grandmother and a great grandmother. And she took on this new age with even more elegance, intensity, and devotion that she had than she had in her previous one. And I, the youngest, and I think specifically because I was the youngest, um, had a front row ticket to this new golden age. Every Shabbos that I was at my grandparents' apartment, um, I would sit to my grandmother's left at the dining room table and I would listen to my grandma sing and harmonize as my grandfather, as my, my dad would sing Kabbalah Shabbat. I saw my grandma take care of my Zaida with such tenderness and love. I would really literally get teary watching them. And while I was at my grandma's apartment, um, my grandma was my own personal lamb family history book, and it took full advantage of it. Um, we talked about everything. I learned about how my grandparents met, um, and I, I learned about all the adventures they subsequently uh, went on together. I asked her every question I could think of. And when I was out of new questions, I asked her questions that I already knew the answers to. I learned her favorite stories until I memorized them and knew exactly when she would laugh, when she would sigh, and when she would pause to think. I know that she used to pat my hand with hers anytime she needed to think. And I knew exactly what she would say when I walked into a room. She would say, Devori. And we talked endlessly about, about our favorite books, our ballets and plays, our mutual hatred of chemistry and our mutual befuddlement that my site actually majored in it. Um, 
And to that point, actually, when my grandma was in the hospital, um, so as you probably know, we weren't allowed to visit her, um, but we all really rallied and we sent her um, faxes and letters and photos of ourself. And I sent her a fax um, asking if being in the hospital was worse than chemistry. And then I also mentioned that when she came home, maybe we would see a play together. And I suggested maybe we would say Les Mis because I know that that was one of her favorites and I'd never seen it before. But my grandma didn't come home. And the golden age that I was so lucky to be a part of came to an end. And I still can't believe it because I was with her on that Shabbos just a few weeks ago and I could still hear her singing Kabbalat Shabbat. And I could still feel her hand on mine as she thought about a funny memory or an interesting story she would like me to hear. And I could hear her laughing as if she was laughing in this room right now. And I feel so grateful, so grateful that I'm the youngest, so grateful that my grandma and I were at the perfect stage of life for each other. So grateful that even though it was cut short, I got to be a part of my grandma's golden age. And so grateful that that's how I'll always remember her. Grandma, it comforts me that you're reunited with your parents, brothers, and sisters. It comforts me that you and Aunt Sarah are together again. And it comforts me that maybe now you could see that even though we weren't able to bring you home from the hospital, we tried so hard. We were so worried about you and we asked for updates so often. We sent faxes to the hospital with letters and pictures for you in the hopes that those would make you feel less alone. And I don't know if you were able to read or understand our letters at the time, but I think maybe now you'll be able to read them and you'll know how much we love you. Grandma, I love you so much and I can't thank you enough for letting me be such a special part of your golden age. Um, hi, my name is Sam Dratch. I'm uh, also one of the grandchildren. Um, I don't know how it's possible to give a proper uh, kavod achram to someone who lived a life so honorably and so full, um, but oh, here we go, I guess. There's a custom recorded by the Ramah that at the Seder, the Balabayas would have his cup of the, uh, each of the Arbor Kosos poured for him as an expression of derech to dine as a free person, but not only as a free person, but as royalty and aristocracy. Uh, the meaning has since developed to many uh, to have not only the Balabayas, the head of the household, have their cup poured for them, but each member of the Seder will have their cup poured for them too. But this development in the, in the Minog creates a quirk, creates a, a paradox, a, uh, a conflict in, in statements that you're making. Because first you got your cup poured for you and you were treated like aristocracy, you're treated like royalty. And then in order to accommodate the person next to you, you pour for them. And the statement does, isn't only that you are a free person, a king or a queen, but once you pour for the person next to you, you become a servant as well. And it seems like such a contradiction should make this development, uh, should, it should, be, should make that it, it be taken out of the Seder completely, because how could that be possibly be? That someone at, at the same moment is both aristocracy, both royalty, and at the same time, a humble servant. I believe, however, that this person, the royal important aristocrat, and the loyal effortful servant are not in conflict. Such a person can exist. And the proof of this is how perfectly and how harmoniously both of these archetypes were represented in grandma. She was aristocracy, she was royalty, the way she lived. And at the same time, she was a servant, a caretaker to all. When I was taking my wife, Sari, out to dinner to meet uh, grandma for the first time, Sari asked me as we were walking in how to describe grandma so she could uh, better be prepared for the meeting. I thought about it for a moment and I said, she's like the British royal family, but without the accent. Sari then turned to me and asked, is, you know, should I be nervous? And a little too honestly, I said, yes, grandma's opinion is very important. As a child, it was immediately obvious the class and sophistication grandma held. Although she denied it later in life, the pizza given to you at her house was to be cut with a fork and a knife. The jelly beans she gave us were, she gave us were served in a crystal bowl with a graceful twist in its side, making it seem more suitable as a vase for a bouquet of flowers than a candy dish. Grandma's house is where you learned that napkins go on your lap. Every sentence, phrase, or story grandma said felt like it was part of a royal address. Peppered with words like marvelous, splendid, and of course, as those who knew her know, lovely. She overflowed with class and grace. 
The importance she projected was not a self-importance or self-interest, but a self-respect. Her class was not a show, but an inborn and fundamental grace. She would often take an answer you gave to one of her questions and summarize it back to you, raising your report to a work of sophistication. I would tell her that yeshiva was going well, and she would respond, well, it seems that you're having a marvelous time in yeshiva. It seems that your rabbi is a fine man and that you were having a splendid semester, and we wish you the best of luck. The summary and wish would be in the middle of a conversation and be said with the same tone and fancy flair as when she would tell the story of her getting a gift from the King of Spain or her conversation with First Lady Bush. But grandma's role was not only one of importance in high class. She was a supportive, on the ground, loving and caring grandma. She was the grandma who would put on an apron and make you challah, challah French toast uh, every Sunday morning. She was the grandma who'd take you to get your hair cut. She was the grandma who'd bring you toys and let you know where the other toys were should you get bored. As her grandmother, she would feed you, clothe you, wash your face, wipe your nose, and do everything in between. She was royal, classy, and aristocratic, but she served in the sense of a dedicated and loving caretaker for children and grandchildren as well. But she was not the only the caretaker of her family. One of my first memories of grandma and Zaida um, in their role as, as, as president of YU um, was overhearing grandma tell one of her children uh, that she needed to go shopping to buy a coat. But the coat wasn't for herself. It was for a poor foreign student who didn't know how bitter the winters would be in, in, in New York. Um, and she needed to buy a coat for this individual. Now, how did the, uh, how did the, the person married to this, uh, to the to person, the, the president of this uh, large institution know about or even care about the plight of this young foreign student now the question didn't bother me then and it doesn't bother me now because that's who grandma was. Of course she knew. And of course she was going to the store to buy this individual a coat. She wore a Yeshiva University necklace around her neck. She was not only the dedicated matriarch of our family but of her community as well. When I first found out grandma was sick I went to my bookshelf and decided to learn something for grandma. More probably also it was because I needed physic as well. I chose to learn a sefer that was important to Zaida called the Ruach Chaim, Ruach Chaim Velazhin Aram Perkayavos. I opened it randomly, hoping to receive some sort of message in that desperate time. I opened it to, to, to Parag Dalad Mishnah Tezayin, and the message was somber. It says, Rabbi Yaakov says that this world is like a vestibule to the next. I say vestibule instead of hallway in honor of my grandma. Prepare yourself in the vestibule to enter into the banquet hall. As far as messages go, this one was somber. But what Rav Chaim Velazhenor wrote, give me chizuk. Rav Chaim asks, how does one prepare themselves for the next world? What does one do in the vestibule to get ready for the banquet hall? He writes that there are 20, 248 organs and 365 sinews in the body, adding up to 613 in total. This corresponds to the 613 mitzvahs. Each time a mitzvah is done, a garment is created for that person, for that part of the body. In the hallway, we are to affix ourselves with garments. Each mitzvah performed adds one beautiful layer after another until one is ready for the banquet of the next world, dressed beautifully and appropriately for the world to come. I sat there sadly imagining grandma, after having lived a successful and full life, being wrapped in beautiful sleeve and scarf, in her case, hat and brooch, one for each mitzvah she's done in her life of righteousness, dedication, and love, with linens and quilts adorning her as she got closer and closer to heaven until she was decorated or if Hamid and Yavin spackled in her deeds of grace and selfless, selflessness and love until she faded into the light. This image was uh, an imagination of mine, but it has to be true because I don't, I don't remember recall grandma ever being unprepared for an event. Her life lived with grace, with beauty, with class, with dedication and with love has prepared her for that, for that banquet. I wanna thank Hashem for giving me such an amazing grandma, this queen and caretaker this absolute powerhouse of a protector and role model for 25 years, and for allowing me to introduce her to my children. When I would go over to grandma's house in my college years and later to bring the kids, I would often ask her about her mother and aunts because I knew she'd like to talk about them. When I would ask her about them, she would look up a little and tell me how marvelous and fine those matriarchs were. When my children ask me about my grandma, I will look up a little, picturing her and say, she was lovely.
My name is JJ Schachter. <clears throat> I'm privileged to be a friend of the Lamb family. I am heartbroken by the passing of Mrs. Lamb, of, of Mindy, extraordinary leader of a loving and caring and adoring family, immediate and extended a leader of an entire community, an outstanding human being. Like I'm sure all of you listening, I've been absolutely overwhelmed by the emotion and the caring and the love and affection that has been expressed by children and grandchildren. And I feel uh, totally inadequate to do justice to Mrs. Lamb and, and, and to Mindy and to represent her many admirers uh, and friends and acquaintances, everyone outside of the circle of her immediate family who had such credible respect and affection for her. What could I possibly add to the extraordinary words of tribute that we've heard? I simply want to frame them in the context of six words at the end of Sefer Mishle. Oz vahadar levusha, Vatishak Leo Maharo. Oz Vahadar, you'd think that they are very different from one another. Oz is strength, and Hadar is beauty, is, is softness. And she was both. She was Oz, she was strong, she was strong minded. She shared directly what was on her mind. She had enormous rock strength of character and enormous strength of faith. And also Hadar, there was beauty, there was aesthetics, not only superficial external beauty with which she was blessed, but the inner radiance and the elegance and the kindness that was not ephemeral, but was constant and ongoing Hadar mi lashon pre eights Hadar, as the Gemara says, Shadar bi ilano mi shano lashana, year in and year out. Hadar perpetual, nonstop, constant, warm and loving and caring, which she bestowed not only on those wonderful members of her family who were so blessed to have her as a mother, as a as, as a grandmother, as a great grandmother, as an aunt, as a family member, but so many of us who were privileged to be part of her circle and who benefited so much from her graciousness and her warmth. All of us, I'm sure, have our stories. Whenever I would come to visit, so how was Yocheved, how are the children, how are the grandchildren, not just perfunctorily, but with sincere interest. And it wasn't just with me, but it was with others as well. She was tender and she was kind, she was loving. After hearing of her passing, a prominent scholar today posted that one of his first presentation, presentations as a rabbinic intern at the Jewish Center was an absolute disaster. It was on Rosh Hashanah, there was no beginning to the sermon, there was no end to the sermon, there was a lot of middle, but not too much else. Mindy Lamb was the first person to approach me after the talk. She told me that her husband also suffered through one of his first sermons. She was probably being overly kind at the time, he writes. Probably, of course she was. She was an individual overflowing with incredible kindness. And so many of us were the beneficiaries. She provide, presided over a royal household, the aristocracy of our modern Orthodox community. As a Rebetzin of the Jewish Center, as the first lady of Yeshiva University and in so many other capacities. Obviously she was a very central partner to her husband, Moreno Verabenu, Dr. Lambs, Olga Zunzai, 
in ways that more than any outsider could possibly ever imagine. But she was not a derivative person, not at all. She was independent and she was a tremendous kayach in her own right. There was O's and there was Hadar. And finally, Vatishchak Leo Macharon. She was joyful to the last day. Just a few weeks ago, it's so hard to imagine. Everything was fine. Smiling, full of life, optimistic, fun loving, so much part of the world. Her heart was huge. But tragically, it was not huge enough to overcome the plague, the cruel plague, which took her away first from her family and then from the rest of us way, way too soon. We have lost a remarkable person. Ho'isha Mendel Basrib Shalom Vitobehesa. Tehei Nishmasa Tzrura Bitzuror Hachai. On behalf of the family, Chaya and Josh and Shalom, with the grandchildren, grandchildren, on behalf of Dr. Lamb, we thank you all very, very much for joining us to pay this tribute to this very wonderful woman. This lovely woman who was so central and so important to our lives. We hope that uh, we will be Zoha to continue her memory and her legacy and to live up to the standards and the, the challenges that she gave to each of us, supported and nurtured in the love that she gave to each and every one of us. If you have memories that you'd like to share with us, there's a um, there's a an email address that's been created. It was on the invitation to this. Um, to, to this gathering, it will be posted on the screen as you sign off. Please do share, and um, may we all be zochet to continue her memory and her legacy for many, many years to come. Thank you very much. <laughs>